Alors, bonjour, bienvenue à tous et bienvenue à la classe de maître de Joanna Gaufreur, flûtiste principale à l'Orchestre du Centre national des arts à Ottawa, au Canada. Aujourd'hui, Mme Gaufreur travaillera avec les participants de l'OF, flûtistes et oboïstes, donnés dans le cadre de notre session 2020-2021. Hi, hello and welcome to all. Welcome to this masterclass that will be given by Joanna Gaufreur, principal flute player at the National Arts Center in Ottawa. Today, uh, Ms. Gaufreur will work with participants of the OS, OF, flute players and oboe players given through our 221 Academy. Nous voulons remercier et reconnaître l'appui du gouvernement du Canada et Emploi Québec et de Montréal. Nous remercions aussi nos commanditaires, Canimex et Panorama Media. L'OF remercie aussi les fondations suivantes, RBC Foundation, la Fondation Sibylla S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada et la Zeller Family Foundation. The OF acknowledge the Government of Canada's support in Emploi Québec et de Montréal. We will also like to thank the, our private sponsors, Canimex and Panorama Media. The OF would like to thank the following foundations, RBC Foundation, la Fondation Sibylla S, le Fonds AIDA de la Fondation Jeunesse Musicale du Canada, and the Zeller Family Foundation. Pour suivre nos activités, nous vous invitons à consulter le site web de l'Orchestre de la Francophonie à orchestrefranco.com, la page Facebook de l'organisme, ainsi que le channel, le canal YouTube et le hashtag OF-2021. To follow our activities, we are inviting you to consult our website, orchestrefranco.com, our Facebook page, and our YouTube channel, as well as the hashtag OF score 2021. Now it's time to present our participant uh, to today, today's masterclasses. Um, I will start with uh, Cheyenne Azilibos Chaloué. Um, Cheyenne, can you tell us a little bit about you, where you're from, school you're studying at, and the teacher you've been studying with? Hello, this is Cheyenne. I'm from Iran, and currently I'm living in St. John's, Newfoundland. My, uh, I'm in a first year a student of Masters of Music with uh, Dr. Michel Sherami. And today I will be playing uh, Beethoven Leonore Overture to excerpts. Uh, Brahms Symphony 4, uh, Mendelssohn Midsummer uh, Night Dream, and Ravel Definite is Cruel. Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, now, next it's, uh, is uh, Daniela Tejada Cortez. Hi, Daniela. Hi. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about yourself? Yeah, and I'm Daniela Tejada. I'm from Colombia. And now I live in Montreal and I'm making my master's degree in the University of Montreal. Thank you very much. Um, Luca, it's your turn. Luca Ortolani. Hi there. Hi. Uh, my, name's, my name is Luca. Um, I'm studying oboe at the University of Toronto. I'm going into my fourth year uh, studying with uh, Sarah Jeffrey. Thank you. Okay, we'll do next. Avery Kennedy. Hello. Hi, Avery. Um, so my name's Avery. I'm from New Brunswick, but I'm currently in Ottawa studying flute with Camille Churchfield at the University of Ottawa. And in, I'm in the third year of my bachelor's degree. Thank you very much. Okay, now we're ready to start masterclass. On est prêt à commencer. Uh, Joanna, it's all yours. Welcome. Okay, thank you, Jose. It's such a pleasure to be here today and to meet all of you. I know Avery and Kyle we've met before, but to meet Luca and Daniela and Cheyenne and uh, looking forward to hearing you play and to working with you today. And um, for those of you watching, we were just discussing how uh, because each person has about four or five excerpts prepared, we're going to start each session as if it's a first round of an audition. So each person will just play their four or five excerpts straight through as if it's uh, those five or six minutes you get uh, behind the screen uh, when you first come into an audition and um, then we will discuss after that. Okay, so Cheyenne, would you like to start, take it away? Sure.
Sorry, trying to unmute myself. <laughs> it took a while there. Wonderful, beautiful playing, Cheyenne. Okay, um, so let's just talk through some of these. Very, very strong playing, lots of great things. Um, of course, with the flutes, I'm, my comments are gonna be more detailed than with the oboes, <laughs> okay? 
um, we might get into, into some pretty detailed stuff here. So um, for flutists, the beginning of this uh, Leonore is always so uh, intimidating for breathing and just sustaining this very long descending scale. I think, Cheyenne, that you can actually start the diminuendo a little sooner, okay, on that G. Um, when I play this, I really think of starting very strong with, with the group, with the rest of the wind section, and then just backing off almost immediately, not like a forte piano, but just coming back. So that really by the time uh, we get to the end of that bar, we're anticipating the piano a little a little bit, right? It's only marked in the second bar, but we can really come back and, and save some air there and also just blend a little more into what's happening in the rest of the wind section. Okay, and then um, as we descend, I always find that when you get to the D, uh, we just need to lift the pitch there. For me, that's always the point where just everything's fine up into that D, and then from the D on, we just need to lift the pitch quite perceptibly. Okay, and then everything that follows will be fine. I didn't find that you were flat, but I felt that you were just in the lower part of, of the note. Just almost flat. <laughs> okay, so we just want to keep it nice and bright and, uh, and centered there pitch-wise. Okay, um, and when you get to that last note of the scale, we want to avoid a, an accent. I would keep the air moving so that it's almost connected into the bar and just use a very soft D for the tongue. Don't do a, a, a ta, but just more of a soft articulation. You just want it to be seamless getting into that F sharp. Um, good. So uh, when we get into the next section with the triplets, the E, F sharp, G, this, this part, I always like to just shape this, give it a little more shape. And I think you can use your vibrato more effectively than you were um, using your vibrato to really show the shape of the phrase. So maybe as you get up to the F sharp and the G, a little more intense with the, with the vibrato. Okay. Just to make it a little more um, interesting with the phrasing there. And then when we get into the triplets, there you're playing this so well, it's so clean and well articulated and rhythmically very, very solid. The only quibble I had was I think that you can make the um, the eighth notes a little more vibrant, okay? Whether that means adding some vibrato or just a little life into them. It felt to me like every time you got to that eighth note, the music just kind of stopped on the eighth notes and then it would pick up again as soon as you started the triplet <laughs> again. Da, da, da. Da, da, da. just keep the life going on those eights. And I like how you had a very consistent length on those eights. Whatever you do when you're playing this excerpt, the flutist, uh, keep consistent on the length of that eighth. Whether you're going to hold it absolutely whole length or a little bit less, that's fine. Just treat them all the same. So Cheyenne, you're doing that so well. I would say, yeah, just, just add a little more life on those those eights so that the it, the music just keeps going and we don't feel like it, it stops on those notes. Um, <clears throat> when you get into the all of this uh, 2D stuff with the repeated eights, um, often this isn't asked for on auditions, but sometimes it is and it's very showing how you play 2D passages, right? Uh, it's, it's important in, in orchestral life, how, how do you treat these passages. It's not only the solos that are important. Um, when we get to these repeated eighths, I would love to hear a little more direction and not quite so short, a little more connected, these notes too, so that we really play, play these as musically as possible. more of that kind of length so a little more again a little more connection a little, keep the keep the music going between the notes okay and always going to your downbeats always giving each of these directions so that they're not so um, up and down okay I think you can again in this 2d passage you can make more difference um, with dynamics and also when you have these very loud eighth notes just on their own
sustain those very long because that's what the orchestra is doing, right? Okay. Um, and then this last section, there's so many details in this excerpt, uh, but this very last section, again, direction in your eighth notes. And I always like to just in a very clean way for Beethoven, after the, um, the tied quarter over uh, to the dotted eighth, just a little separation. So it's nice and clean. And those grace notes really on the beat. Da, 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 da. Okay, and the same with the, the next bars. Ta, ta, ta. Just a little bit of daylight before you hit the attack the G. Okay. Um, does that all sound good? <laughs> Comments? All make yes, sense? That's amazing. Thank you so much. Okay, you're welcome. Um, and I would love to just, you know, have you play these things, but I, I'm not sure that we have time to really do much more than, than comments. Why don't we go through all the excerpts and if there's time, maybe I'll ask you to just play some of this if we have a few minutes again. Um, with the next excerpt, I thought this was really solid. I just think you can have more energy in this whole solo. It's so vibrant and alive and joyous, this, this solo, and I think you just need to put a little more energy into it. Um, your articulation's great, your rhythm's great, everything's nice and clean. Um, just, it just needs a little more something, a little more oomph to, you know, when, when you're playing an audition, um, especially in a first round, uh, the panel is really, especially because you'll see when, when I'm working with you oboists, it's going to be a lot less detailed. <laughs> um, what I, when I'm on a panel for uh, an audition for an instrument that is not the flute, um, I'm listening for very basic things. Beautiful sound, rhythm, articulation, intonation, and of course, is there that some, some kind of magical um, uh, musical quality that just is very convincing and just make, kind of wakes you up. Sometimes when you're on a panel behind a screen, you're listening to you know, 50, 75 people all playing the same thing and you, it just takes that something special to wake you up and go, oh, that's really interesting, right? So I think Cheyenne, for you, just adding that bit of energy into this Beethoven excerpt will, will do that. It will just uh, bring it to the next level. Excitement. Um, Okay, and then the one last detail I have with that was just, I think you can play around with the sound you want on that last D, the pianissimo. Um, what kind of, what are you thinking of in terms of a, like a sound that would just, a describer for that sound you're going for on that last D? Is there some way you can describe it? It's a very smooth sound with lots of lower harmonies. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should be even, uh, piano not piano yeah <laughs> yes yeah all of that sounds great um i would say maybe in your image of what you're going for here think of the sound a little more transparent okay because it's such a dramatic moment we're going from being the soloist to all of a sudden being part of a pianissimo chord or as you say maybe even triple piano um so it's just it's like night and day it's like a light switches on and then you turn it off or something just very dramatic, whatever image works for you. Um, and I often like to, if we're preparing this, actually just practice the transition. So find the sound first that you want. Something that's supported and that is going to be nice and solid. You're not going to lose the note, but that is very, very quiet and transparent. And then practice the transition from forte before that. Sorry. Something like that. Um, so that you just practice that. It's a very big embouchure change you need to make to be successful with that change. So if we can just practice the, the switch on its own instead of the whole excerpt all the time. <laughs> I think you'll... You'll get there. Okay, good. Let's move on to the Brahms. 
um, I really liked your introduction. I thought it was had a nice uh, lyrical long line with those triplets. It's sometimes hard to navigate through all those rests and make it sound like one line, but I really felt like you did. And um, the descending scale I thought was great, but you had a, a quite a big crescendo at the end of it, getting into the solo. And I would suggest, I know it's hard to know what to do uh, as you're getting into that solo, but I always think of it less of a crescendo because we are actually in diminuendo as we're going down. Um, more just a transition, okay? We're coming from material from before that's very sunny and happy. And in this tr descending scale, we are transitioning to something a lot darker, okay? A totally different mood. So if we can think of it um, more to do with color and mood changing in those last three notes. Um, So then when you start on the E, I don't, I, it's hard to hear with headphones on. I don't know if I did that very well, but what I'm thinking of is in the last three quarters before the three, two, that we are sort of entering a different world. And if you can do that less with a dynamic change, but more with a color change, I think it's very, very effective. Okay. Um, good. Uh, what we in the body of the solo so once we're in the three two um re always remember that the horns are playing so you really do have a steady pulse that you have to adhere to okay it's easy when we're when we play it alone so many times that we can get a little um indulgent with stretching in places and have you played this before in orchestra have you have you done it with orchestra no no okay um when you do when you when you do play it with orchestra you will find that um it feels a little constricting because we've we've gotten used to playing it on our own for so long and you have these um uh, uh, the horns come in like this and you have to stick with them there's not that much room um but within that of course this is the the artistry that you can do in here is what you do within that framework, right? So um, I really like your uh, your shaping uh, of the phrases and all the way up to the F sharp. Their conductors will usually let you take a little time on the way up to the F sharp and just after, and then it keeps going. So just keep that in mind in your preparation of this. Um, I did feel that uh, you needed more body in the sound when you go down to the low register in the last couple of bars. Okay, I felt this is always hard that uh, we've been in the middle and high register for so long and then you need to sustain that uh, soloistic quality down into the low register. So you just need a little more sound down there. And just it, one little bit of housekeeping is just to really um, pay attention. I like that you're getting a nice long line through this solo. It really should just feel like one line over all the rests, but watch note lengths before the rest and your entrances after the rests that um, the note lengths are always consistent before the rest and that when you come in after the rest, you come in just as you left off. So no accents, make sure the uh, dynamic is exactly the same as the note before the rest. Then we will get even more sense of line and continuity through this long solo. Okay, does that does that make sense? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Good, okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh yeah, we better get through this. So Mendelssohn I thought was very, very strong. Um, you know, I, I was looking, because you sent, you all sent your own parts. I was looking at some of the markings you have in here, which are often groups of two, two, two. Okay, that you have brackets around them. And I was wondering if I would hear that because I often like to think um, more in groups that go over the bar line. So, um, that kind of thing, instead of um, 
as your markings for it. But you know, I really, I didn't hear anything that bothered me. I thought it sounded very, very smooth and the phrasing was really nice. Yeah, those marks for info uh, are for practicing, not for... Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, interesting to know that. Okay, good. And just to throw out there too, when you have the um, sort of hemiola passages in here where you have groups of three, where you could think of them, it's kind of fun and a little um, interesting and jazzy a bit to, to throw that into your thinking once in a while when you're playing this. I find it, it's a good thing to do. Okay. And then at the very end, just watch that you're um, not coming in late after that little breath there after the D. Okay. Coming in on the with a little late. And remember that this is, this is the main theme of this movement, right? So we have to be really, really on there. I know that that's the only place to take a breath and we need it there desperately, but it's very important to come in on the C, um, some on time and some conductors will even ask when you're playing the scherzo to give a little accent so that it's really placed. So I think we need to keep that uh, cleanliness there at the end of this excerpt. I know it can feel like such a relief. Ah, I got through it, you know, and I made the breath and everything, but yeah, don't relax until you get right to, to the end. Okay. And then, so, yeah. Oh, sorry, I have to on? do my timekeeper role. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think someone else is also playing the Ravel, so we can talk more about it then, but I just want to oh, say to Cheyenne, um, I think you can do more with your vibrato in this excerpt. Variety and speed of vibrato, I think that will add a new dimension to all the great things that you're already doing in this excerpt. So listen for places where you can make the vibrato a little faster, a little shallower or, or opposite, and use that especially in your long, in your sustained notes to add interest and color, okay? Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. It's a pleasure to hear you. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you, Cheyenne. Uh, now it's time for uh, our next participant, uh, Daniela Tejada Cortes. Hi, Daniela. So you are going to play Rossini, Beethoven, Tchaikovsky, Ravel Strauss. Is that yeah. right? Okay. Yeah.
Okay. Beautiful playing. Such a pleasure. And um, as I said before, this is going to be less detailed. You know, we don't have reeds to deal with and all of that. <laughs> but I have been uh, sitting next to one of the best oboists in the world, in my opinion, for about 30 years now. So <laughs> I, um, I have in my ear, you know, what what uh, great oboe playing sounds like. And I know what I, what I hear beside me every day. Um, you guys are working with Chip, right? Yep. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Um, so uh, let's start with the Rossini. Um, I thought this was really, really great. I think you can just, with this opening, sing more. You can, you know, really treat it like an opera aria. Like you're a great diva and you're on this, you're on, on stage under the spotlight. Okay, I think you can do more with this soloistically. Okay, um, take take time where you want to and just broaden with sound, vibrato, everything that you feel might be effective in this. Try different things. Um, more more fantasy. Okay, that's as a listener behind a screen and in, in a or in a panel. That's what I would I would want to hear something that really grabs me. Okay, so you've got a beautiful sound, you've got beautiful phrasing, you're doing all the right things, just just give it a little more of yourself in there, and a little more soloistic quality, okay? I also think that you can um, continue your music making through a lot of these rests. So like when you get to um, after the first phrase and you have the, the, um, the eighth notes and then, the, and then the, the bar following with the half and the, the um, quarter note, just to sustain your line through those rests so that you keep interest. It just sounded like you got to the end of the phrase at bar nine and then for a couple of bars there, it just lost, lost the magic. Okay, so keep our interest through that. Um, I find, you know, this was something I found through the audition was that sometimes your uh, notes at the ends of phrases are not sustained long enough. Does that make sense? Yeah. Just that I find often they're cut off, they're not sustained to the end, that the phrase feels like it's not quite ended properly or how you would want to end it. A little incomplete. Okay? So, um, let's see if I marked a specific place. We'll, we'll talk about that again later. I think I heard that more in the Beethoven. Um, I would like to hear more expression and vibrato in bar 19 on those accents on the E's. Okay, I think you can lean into those a little more with vibrato. Uh, I'm used to hearing more of a, a lift before the Allegro, a little bit more time before the D. Is that normal? I've just never heard it gone into so quickly. Um, yeah, I have never played it in, in an orchestra. So, um... Let it settle before placing the D. There is that uh, comma marked there, so I would observe that. You know, when you have, when you're playing in uh, an audition, you can't see who's on the panel, right? Because there's a screen. But normally there'll maybe be one or two people who play your instrument on that panel. I know uh, in the NACO, we often have, I can't remember what it says in the collective agreement now, it keeps changing, but the panel is often sort of 12 or 13 people and they're, they're from all through the orchestra, right? So you may only have one oboist back there. <laughs> I find if I'm, if I'm on a panel for a different instrument, there are often lots of questions in the breaks, like, is it hard to do this on the, that instrument or is it hard to do that? Or what, what makes it so difficult to, because people are curious and they wanna know and they wanna judge correctly, but we often don't know the details of each other's instruments, you know, what what is incredibly hard to do and, and why. So um, yeah, the, what you're hearing from me is what the kinds of comments I would be writing down if I was hearing an instrument not my own on the panel. And those are gonna be most of the people who will be voting in your audition, just to keep that in mind. So um, at the Allegro, I just found your articulation a little too short in the staccatos. So I know, are you double tonguing or single tonguing that? My double tonguing. Double tonguing on the flute is much easier than on reed instruments. But for us, I always try and think of when we're double tonguing, keeping 
the ends of the notes open so you don't get a tuck but more ta ta ka ta ka wait to um re-articulate with the k so that the notes instead of um oh, that's sort of what i'm hearing I think of playing them longer so that they, the end of the note remains open and alive. It's not cut off. I don't know how that will um, apply to oboe playing. It works for flute, but <laughs> if it can help at all to think of it that way, um, I, I would like to hear those notes just a little more um, open so that it, they don't sound so, 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 so detaché. Okay. Um, Good. Let's move on to another excerpt. Let's go to the Beethoven. So um, the pickups, um, I know that this is always the thing for oboists. How do you play the dot, right? Do you play it more towards the triplet? Do you play it really exact? I know that I've heard people talking about it. So um, I think I would like to hear from you a little more lyrical in those pickups. Does that make sense? So right now, I think maybe they're a little too square, too perfect, but you don't want to go too far either. But something that just sounds a little more lyrical and singing. Da, da, da. Maybe it's also just the intention that you're moving forward into the downbeat. Okay. Uh, here is where I was hearing the, the issue with lengths, note lengths. At the ends of phrases, so da -da 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 -da. you want that C to be a full length. I just found it more like a sixteenth. Okay, finish off your phrases. Really play right to the end of the note, the end of the phrase. Okay. Um, I think in bar um fourteen fifteen where you have the crescendo. I think you should, I felt like the crescendo ended a bit before the bar line. Make sure you crescendo into the downbeat of bar 15. Okay, and we can even mark that with a bit of vibrato or something. So, something that shows the downbeat, even though you're tied. Okay, think of a tenuto even within the note. Um, yeah, again, as a very basic thing I would be listening for in an audition, more dynamic range. Okay. So when, when I see a piano marked on the part, I really want to hear that. So bar 43, for example, I did not hear the, that you were playing piano there on that long note. So I would just remember again, I can't say it enough. The people on your audition panel will not all, all be oboists. They're going to be people like me looking for that says piano there. Why don't I hear that? <laughs> okay. Really, uh, really show that you are playing the music that is written. Okay. Um, now I really like that you went into the, the major because this is the part where you play with the flute quite a bit. I, I know this part more because I'm playing with the oboe. Um, again, length of the last note before the rest. Right, play right until that beat three, okay? Right until the, the next beat. And I think you need more separation in your sports sandy. Again, be very aware of the, the tootie, what the orchestra is doing and match. We often have to really match what the strings are doing with their length of bow, their length of stroke. Okay, so that's, we often we have to look visually to see what they are doing and match. Okay, let's move on. Tchaikovsky, beautifully done. Um, I thought you could just, you know, I'm sure this is a common comment with this uh, excerpt, but I just felt like it could flow a little more. Okay, just a little more flowing. Um, it's not so much the tempo, it's just a, a sense of always moving forward, not getting stuck in one place, but always, the music is always moving forward. 
Um, and then just a couple of things, dynamics. I, I'd love to hear more of the hairpins in like bar 14, 15, 16, 17, those swells, just exaggerate those a bit more. And the other thing I just wanted to say was um, when you take your breath after the A in bar nine, make sure when you re-enter to not accent the D flat so that we have a lift there, but it's not so much an ending and a new beginning. It's a continuation. At least that's what I heard that I, I think I would like to hear that. Okay, good. And we had the Ravel I thought was really good. That always sounds like such a nightmare for my oboe colleagues to play. <laughs> very scary um i i thought it was very very solid and let's just use the last couple minutes for strauss um yeah so i thought this was really really nice again kind of like in the rossini i think you can take over a little more as a soloist and just be even more expressive what you're doing but you know times two or times three okay really really uh soloistic and and taking us the listeners on a real journey invite us in okay and um i think the you have a very long crescendo uh in the middle of this excerpt uh you know where that is that between m and well after m i think you should maybe start less so that the crescendo is more dramatic and more graded all the way up to uh I guess, does it go to the B? And then you, you have a dim. That's where the flute takes over, right? Yeah. Da, 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 we go to the E. We take over the melody there from you. And actually, this was my last comment, was just to be really aware, and this is for everybody, when you're playing orchestral um, excerpts in an audition, to be absolutely aware of what else is going on in the orchestra imagine it in your head so for instance in that passage where the flute does enter and take over the melody you want to really pass it to the flute even though there's not a flute beside you imagine there is and that you are passing that melody off to the flute okay it really works you just have to get in that mindset that you are in the orchestra and all of those parts are happening right around you and they, they are there they are happening maybe not in real life but in your mind they are um and then similarly, uh, the clarinet takes over a few bars later, right? Ba -da -da -dum, ba -da -da -dum, when you've got that chromatic stuff. So again, just be have that as part of what you're doing. Have those parts as part of the music you're making. Okay. It really does come across in uh, in auditions. You know, um, my audition that I did for this my job, which was 29 years ago now. <laughs> Um, I remember I, one of the comments that uh, I got was that I, it, people were laughing about it afterwards, that was that I sounded very experienced. And can you imagine, I was, when I was doing the initial audition, I was 19 years old. So I had not played very much of that music in orchestra at all. I just played along with recordings, mostly. So it, it is possible to project that kind of experience by hearing the parts around you and just showing in you how you're playing that you are aware you are aware of the whole orchestra okay all right okay so kyle you're going to play bach a little yep. bit of bach beethoven seven afternoon of a fawn and four yep. great okay
good. Bravo. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, let me ask you first, why did you include the Bach in your list? Uh, I wanted some Bach and I wanted something that I haven't really looked at a lot. Um, I know in Pittsburgh that it was included on their, it was either a second or associate, and I know they included it on their list. So I figured it okay. would be a nice addition. Yep. Okay. Well, often on audition lists, there may be a solo piece, Bach, or I've seen Mozart D major flute quartet. I've seen, well, obviously we have the Mozart concerti. Um, but uh, sometimes we had on our second flute audition last year, we had syrinx. There can be things that pop up. Sometimes it'll be something the orchestra's played recently. They've heard their own principal play it recently. So the, the panel kind of has a good idea in their mind or the conductor will say they want to hear a particular piece. You just, you never know. But yeah, solo pieces do creep in on, other than the Mozart concerti do creep in here and there on the audition list. So, um, so Pittsburgh had it on. So just thinking of why, why they would have included it. So maybe just to hear uh, stylistically what people do with Bach. That's always a bit of a trap though on, on an audition for an orchestra because you don't know what people are expecting. You don't know their tastes. You don't know if people have really strong ideas about whether you use vibrato or not, or to be really authentic or to be more modern. I mean, you just, it's kind of a wild guess. So um, I would say to go middle of the road in something like this and then be flexible and ready, which is always a good idea in an audition. Uh, for someone to ask you to do it differently. Okay, so uh, if someone says, can we hear it again with no vibrato at all? Be ready to do that. Can we hear it again, you know, faster, slower, whatever, be ready. Um, so yeah, I would present it as something kind of like you did with some vibrato, you know, but not uh, too much. Okay. Um, I think uh, I would say right off the top, I would like to hear those first four bars in one breath. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Especially because it could be, it probably wouldn't be the first thing you'd play on a first round, but it might be the first thing you play it on a second round. Okay. Mm -hmm. Typically. Um, make sure you're supporting to the ends of phrases. You know, it, it was lovely what you did, but just a couple of things. Um, you know, the rhythm in bar um, 10 is uh, incorrect, right? It's been corrected in, what What edition is this that you have? Uh, that's a great question. I think I sent you one that must have been, it was off of IMSLP. I think okay. it was just a um, digitized version of the manuscript. Mine is a strange one from, uh, I think the, from Amsterdam. So <laughs> okay. I don't know if I trust mine. So yeah, that, so I have, um, Baron writer and it has been it's been corrected in ink uh like if there's a correction above i don't know if you can see that sure is it the same rhythm as two measures later? yes it's yeah. corrected to that so it should match so okay. that's pretty i think i would feel safe uh making that correction for for an audition that's always another question is if you have if there are um excerpts that have mistakes in them <laughs> Sometimes the orchestra, often the orchestra will send out their own copies and once in a while there'll be a mistake in it. <laughs> what do you do with that? Well, you call whoever is organizing the audition, the personnel manager, whoever, you contact them and ask them because right. you want to make sure that uh, it's straight. <laughs> you know, it's like this is, you're, no one's going to think that you're making a mistake either by playing the wrong note or by, or by playing the right note. It should just be absolutely clear as day. So. That happens sometimes. Okay, so yeah, let's go on to, so Beethoven 7, um, this was very strong. I just, okay, so this passage with the E's. Yeah. Um, I think you th wanna get a bit of a different sound here and it's gonna be a sound that will blend with the oboe an octave lower, right? So if you can get an oboist friend to practice this with you, it would be the best <laughs> thing so that you can just find it. But um, it's something, how would you describe that? It's maybe a little more focused, a little more center in the sound, but not 
but also because you're playing the higher octave, you don't want to give too much sound. You want to let the lower octave and the oboe kind of be the predominant one, and then you're just riding an octave higher. But yeah, oh, maybe a little more center. Okay, P play it with an oboe, and you'll find it. You'll find it. It'll just become obvious. Um, I think. The trick, though, rhythmically with this section is to just, again, think of it like one long line from where these E's start right to the end. So, etc. So that's it's just like I'm not really coming up for air, right? I'm inhaling a little bit through my nose, but I'm just kind of, it's just one long thought, no stopping and starting, okay? As if you were just playing one held E through the whole thing. And I think your the pickups, the uh, 16s can be a little more exact, da, 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 right on. Um, when you get into the Vivace, the, the little notes, the 16th E's, have to be a little clearer than you're playing them. Really, ta 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 It's not shorter, but it's, uh, again, you want a nice line through these, but clearer. I just wasn't hearing the, are you going ta ka ta or ta ta ta? Ta ka ta. I think that's what I was hearing. I, I, you should play ta 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 ta. Yeah, it, it's going to sound better. Okay. Um, and then here's, okay, this is my last comment. Um, when you get into the tune, sustain the long notes a little more. I find the energy flags near the end of the note. So I'm hearing a bit. the energy through the line. I was, That's gonna help. Trying, I was trying to do a diminuendo, so mm -hmm. that makes you, sense. <laughs> but you can still taper the note a little bit while, while still having energy and vibrato in it right. and, and keeping the sound a little more alive. Okay. Does that make sense? Thank you. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And here's a good example. So I'm doing a diminuendo, but I'm still keeping the energy. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Still, still sustaining. And I think you can make more um, uh, for when you have the sportsandos at the end. You can treat these a bit differently. So a little more impulse right at the beginning of the note. Show the difference between the markings. OK. Uh, so Debussy. OK, so this is my main comment is to do with um this, we we're talking about this a lot today just having a sense of flow mm -hmm. through this keeping things moving and not stopping and starting so much okay so i find what i find uh, in general is when you're taking a breath you're really taking a lot of time and it's like you're finishing a thought and then you're kind of starting over again and i would really like to hear your lines continuing through your breaths in most places. Okay, and then, and I feel like in some of those places, you're just getting a little stuck. The music's getting a little stuck and it just needs to keep flowing forward. And this is the thing when you're playing excerpts on your own, right? I mean, in the orchestra, you have, you're carried by the orchestra. They keep you going, the conductor keeps you going, your colleagues keep you going, but it's hard to create that on your own. <laughs> <laughs> but you need you need to again it's that sense of showing in the audition that you are part of the orchestra in your mind you're you're in it you know what's going on and so um for example when you get to the big section at two and you have there are a few places you're breathing the, all the breaths are fine right you're breathing before the a at the 12 8 and you're breathing a bit before the next 12 8 on the c sharp you know but just it's just a matter of keeping going through those right um yeah 
you know, going right on into that. And um, this is the other big spot. I know this is, oops, sorry, I'm just. Right, there is rubato in there and there is time, but it's, it's still got forward motion. It's still um, life in that moving forward. By the way, since we're there, I loved you had good vibrato and intensity going up to this climax here. But don't lose it until you go down the octave. Keep it on the high C all the way through the note. In fact, I don't, I like to move that decrescendo a little further along because we need the volume still on that low C. When we go down the octave, we need to keep up the intensity a bit. Okay. Um, so for the opening solo, uh, I felt like it was a bit slow. Don't make it, don't make it too hard. You know, don't make it harder than it already is. Like think when you're approaching this solo, think of what, think of the tempo at two, okay? Think of what your eighths notes are there. And you don't have to be metronomic at the beginning, obviously you're free, it's a, it's a big solo. But, um, but keep that in mind as, as a, you know, as a marker, that that's where you're going to be. So it shouldn't be a huge amount slower than that. It should okay. still have a bit of that life. Um, I think you can be smoother after the first bar getting to that C sharp again, I'm hearing um, quite a lot of articulation on the C sharp. I would avoid that almost slurred in just a little duh. Um, and what articulation are you using at the very top? If any, uh, at the beginning. Yeah. Nothing. Just trying to yeah. bring the ear down so it connects. You're getting a little bit of a whistle at the beginning, which it's easy. To, uh, it happens to me too. I, I heard um, a few years ago at Doman Pahud was talking about um, getting the uh, air out your nose a little bit first. Okay. He likes to do that. But I think this is a place that it's really, it really kind of works because it's that thing of you taking a huge breath and then you have to start this incredibly <laughs> delicate <laughs> sound. And how do you get the air to start gently? Well, I've tried it a bit and I think it, it's a good idea. And it really works that once you have this huge breath in, start with letting a bit out your nose. And, and that can be kind of a gentler way of getting it started. Okay. Um, watch your pitch on the B at the end of the solo, a little flat. And we always want to lift the A sharp to match the oboe coming in. It's just, that's always a trap. We always have to do that. Um, just to, I think you're the only one playing this. Avery, you're not playing it, I don't think. Um, just to say with this solo uh, that it's, it can be such a, a mental uh, battle, uh, this opening solo, to try it and do it one breath or try and do it with just one breath. And uh, I always like to breathe just before the last three notes. That's my preferred place. But um, I find that uh, to help with the mental preparation for playing this solo that uh, it can help to play it, what I call reverse metronome work, play it really, play it faster than it's mm -hmm. supposed to go. Find a speed on your metronome that's quite a bit faster where you can play it in one breath comfortably. Always, you know, keep the sound you want, keep the colors you want, the all everything so that it, you're not damaging what you want to do. Keep it as you want it, but just play it like you're playing a uh, tape just fast speed <laughs> so everything's there but it's just a little and then what you can do is as you're practicing opposite of what you normally do with metronome work trying to get faster just stretch it get a little slower the next day and then a little slower the next day but always keep your breath where you want it so that your body just gets used to using your breath and playing the whole phrase as you want it but just gradually gradually stretching it out to longer and longer and I find that that's a good uh, it works, but it's also a confidence booster. It it helps. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. And then Dvorak. Um, 
Okay, so this is really strong. I just, two things. One is you're losing time in your breaths. Okay, so uh, both the little ones, like after dum, da da dum, ba da dum, right, those ones, they just need to be faster. And then also make sure when you breathe after the long notes on the repeats, so you come in on time. It's just, you're just losing time there. Um, and when you breathe after those long notes, keep the, the sound. I always find um, if you can vibrate right to the end of the note before your breath, then the note is still kind of out there in the hall, right? So that the breath isn't so intrusive. So yeah, vibrate right through the end of the note and right, right up until the, the moment when you breathe. Okay. Good, good energy in that. Just some small details. Okay, I think Jose, we probably need to, I'm not keeping track of the time. We probably <laughs> need to move, right? <laughs> okay, so thank you, Kyle. Thank you, Joanna. Beautiful playing. Thank you. And now we have Luca. Thank you for waiting, Luca. Hi there. No, Hi. It's been a pleasure oh. to listen to everyone else. Yes. Okay, so we have Tchaikovsky, Rossini, Beethoven, and Ravel. Yes. Perfect. Not in that exact order, but yes. Okay.
beautiful. Really great to hear this. Hear, great to hear you play. Um, yeah, I've heard about you for a long time, but we've never met. Yeah, I know. <laughs> nice to meet you finally. <laughs> okay. Um, great. So I loved your Tchaikovsky. Um, do you know the very first day I met Chip in 1989, I heard him play this solo. We were oh, playing really? Tchaik 4. Yeah, we were wow. at... Um, 1989 we were at uh interlochen music camp together okay. so we we had you know just arrived and we'd done the auditions whatever and then we got plunked together in the orchestra so it was principal flute and oboe and so and the first thing we played was check four and i was like who is that guy beside me he's amazing yeah you've heard so. from the best oh yeah yeah um so i thought you played this beautifully uh just a couple of things uh that F, um, I know it's really low. And is it, I hear an accent on that. And of course, musically, it would be nice it's, if there wasn't one. I'm trying to diminuendo. Yeah. In the diminuendo, if it's if it doesn't come out right, then it like honks. And I was really yeah. disappointed with that. But yes, oh. it, I, I'm trying to, to diminuendo it before yeah. the start of the next little. It's so funny because flute and oboe are such opposites to do with like our low register. We're just trying to get enough sound and yeah, it's yeah. quite a bit softer down there. So yeah, I know it's always the opposite. Okay. Uh, and I loved uh, where we were talking about that breath place before you, did you take a breath or did you just make a musical breath? I don't take um, a breath in the yeah. one. Yeah. But you you lifted it really nicely mm -hmm. so it breathed let's say the music breathed there which was quite nice i liked that very much yeah um i thought you could have a little more vibrato um and just pressing the notes a little more when you have the repeated the three repeated notes so so I think adding a little vibrato on the second of those three will help with the, the crescendo and just with the line. And I, I thought that was really well prepared and beautifully played. Um, in the Allegro, when you come in on that A, I felt like it could have more presence and just a little more, like it's such a shocking moment, yeah. right? Like no one's expecting that. And it's just like, here I am, just, just kind of, I think it maybe needs to be a little more declarative. Like I'm playing for it. Don't be, don't be shy about it. <laughs> you know, just that's what it is. And then this figure, we, you know, we have that flutes and piccolo have that all through this movement. Um, different, we're playing different notes than you, but <laughs> in different places. But um, when you have this, I think those eights can be shorter and a little more energy in them. I'm just thinking of how we play them, especially the piccolo. Yeah. There's just such a brilliance in that writing, right? Just, okay. I think it needs a little more. Also the accents, I think you can bring out more, all of this. Um, a little more front on the note, a little more, yeah. Okay. okay. You're welcome. Um, so Brasini. Yeah, I thought this was beautiful. Um, again, I think you should just sort of even more just sort of take ownership of this aria, right? Just really, you're you're such a soloist here. And I think with these, um, the ascending six, think of how, how would a great singer approach those intervals? How would they connect them? How would they get from here to up to here? Sometimes it helps to just sing it. <laughs> Get away from the instrument. Just think, oh, how do how do I do that? And what does it sound like? And what does the voice naturally do? And then try and imitate that on on your instrument. I just thought those could be more connected and more um, singery. So is it, is it out the interval a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, it's more like the yeah, the space between those two notes, right? Okay. What do you do? What do you, sometimes the magic isn't in sort of the, the beginning of the note or the note itself, it's what you do to get from one note to the next. It's that space in between the notes. Do you want to just try that once? Just um, maybe think, I mean, if I think in practical terms, if I was playing that, I would think a little 
longer on the bottom to connect more. Yep, and try the next one. Yeah. Yeah, I like that one even better. Yeah, just that that those intervals can be so magical, but I think they're the most singer-like of this whole <laughs> this whole opening. Definitely. So just yeah, I often uh, will say that to my students or just in my own practicing, think of okay, how how would what does it sound like if I actually sing it? Not that I'm a good singer; I'm terrible. But how would how would a, how would the human voice approach that uh, that phrasing? Okay. Okay. Good. I I really really liked what you did here. Um, in the uh the fast part, are you double tonguing this? No, I'm not. No, you're single. Okay. I'm single tonguing this. It's it's just sounded a little uneven to me. Yeah. Have you do you double tongue? Is that something? Um. My double tonguing is worse. Okay. For this excerpt, like Got it. I, I use it for other things. I just I find that I like the, um, like what you were talking about the like the more roundness of a single tongue for yep. this excerpt. Um, yep. And I don't mind playing it on the slower side for the, like for it so that I can achieve like the other articulations. Yeah. Um, but yes, you're right. I did fumble a couple of times with the slurs and stuff. Okay. Well, I just, I was just wondering about the, when you have a lot of repeated tonguing, whether um, mm -hmm. it could just be a little more even. Okay. Yeah. Uh, rhythmically that just right. sometimes they weren't speaking quite, uh, quite evenly enough. So are you, are you talking about like in the bar three, like with the repeat tongue? Yeah. Tongue? Okay. Yeah. 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 So it wasn't so much in the slurred parts. I was noticing that it was more when you have a lot of repeated tonguing. Okay. Yeah, and I'm using, I'm looking at your part here. Do you, I forget, at the very ending, was that all tongued all the way down the scale? Uh, I do tongue, uh, so on bar, beginning of the second last bar, the E to the C slurred, and then the rest is tongued. Okay, okay. Just, I, just picking up on what you're saying there, that you, I know um, you're saying you don't mind it being a little slower. Yeah. Okay, that's fine. But remember, if you get into an audition and people want to hear you play it a bit faster, mm -hmm. that yeah. could happen. So you always need to be prepared. There are some excerpts where you really need to have sort of three tempos yeah. ready to pull out of a hat. <laughs> because you just don't know what um, people are used to hearing in a particular orchestra. They may have been working for, you know, with a particular conductor for the last decade and they like to take at a certain speed. And that's just what people are used to hearing. Yeah. The thing is in an audition to remember if they're asking you to do something again a bit differently, it means they like you. They want to hear more. <laughs> um, okay. So then we had um, Beethoven. Yeah. Um, again, I really liked this. Really, Luca, I think it's beautifully played. Um, and I loved how you kept, you did keep the crescendo through the bar at 14 to the downbeat because we have the harmonic change right so you really heard I could hear in your playing that you were hearing the music that you could hear that that was happening um ah I know what I yeah the only thing I really wrote down was um I just felt like uh, it was incredibly musical but maybe add a little more of the funeral into your march in the <laughs> and I don't mean tempo the tempo was great I just mean the kind of um expression that you're putting okay. i just felt like it was not quite sad enough something about what i was hearing it just felt a little too happy in the forte <laughs> yep okay. yep yeah. oh it, that's what you're asking in the forte um no i just thought in general okay. in general yeah just my two cents as a flute player that's all <laughs> Um, and then the Ravel, you know, this all sounded really good to me too. And I, I know it's low and it's really hard for you guys. And it sounded quite smooth to me. Um, 
the one thing I noticed is near the end that rhythm, but I'm but I'm just getting to the F sharp quickly enough so that the it doesn't sound like da dum da dum but da dum da dum. And I think the when you played it at the beginning, it was fine. It was maybe just with the different fingerings when you go to the when you're doing it on the F sharp later. Yeah. Da -da -dum. Ah. Yeah. Okay. I think you know what? I think we should probably we're running out of time, so we should probably move to Avery. Thank you so much for playing. It was a pleasure to hear you. you. Okay. Hi, Avery. Hello. Hi. So you have Brahms, Ravel, Mendelssohn, Beethoven, Prokofiev. Okay. Okay.
let's talk about the very opening of the Brahms with the triplets. Can we make that, again, we were talking about this earlier with the rests in here, that visually it's hard, it is jarring. It sounds like, it, or it looks like it's just a bunch of little bits, but we need to tie it into more of a line. So why don't you try once um, playing, get rid of the rest. Sorry, let me switch back to my better mic. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Play it like that once for me. Yeah, yeah. So then if we just put those rest back in is like little hiccups, but don't let them interrupt what you just did. Okay. Okay, play it one, play it one more time without the rest. Just, just slur all the way through. Right away, just insert them back in, but keep your line. Yes, beautiful. Okay, that's how I want you to play that opening. Okay, good. So, and like we were talking about with Cheyenne before, that descending scale, um, for me, I mean, it's over a number of years I've come to this, but I think it's those last three notes before the three, two, where something changes in the color and mood. What I heard was on the three, two, all of a sudden you were louder. So I think it can be a little more finessed than that, a little more subtle. Um, so we change color. So you mark it, you show the audience that something different is about to happen. But it's not so much a dynamic change. It's more other stuff. <laughs> Colors, vibrato, experiment with it. Okay, but some it's something that happens in those last three notes before the three two that is a it's a change it's a change moment from what came before to what's about to happen. Okay, and then the big thing for me in the Brahms um, is your vibrato. So we need to just be a little more conscious about where the vibrato lies in this uh, movement. And what it is, is it's always going to be um, a battle because naturally when we go up on the flute, we get louder and <laughs> we have to fight that a bit. We, what I'm hearing from you, not all the time, but some of the time in here is the last note is getting the vibrato and the expression, not the appoggiatura note, which should be the most expressive. So Instead of, we want to hear, is what you always want to lean on. Lean on it with emphasis and with your sound, but also with a bit of vibrato, okay? Um, and sometimes it's easier. We go down, right? That one feels more natural <laughs> to put the vibrato on the B and then come away on the A. Okay. Good. So just that's the main thing I want you to look at in this whole excerpt all the way through is just listen, maybe record yourself, listen to where is your vibrato happening and is it where you want it to be? Okay. okay. This is the thing is you're where, you know, you're a very expressive player and you play beautifully. And at a certain point, we need to just get a little more organized sometimes with that expression. What are we doing with vibrato? Is it where I intend it to be, or is it just kind of happening on its own? We need to take take a little more control. Of that okay, good. Um, so Ravel, good. Um, you had a beautiful opening. I'm going to suggest that because you have those three G sharps, one after another, that you maybe think of them in a sequence a bit. That the first one is not quite so strong maybe and then the second one has a little more intensity and then you lead to the third one okay and again we're talking about a combination of 
dynamics and vibrato and color. But what can you do to make it a little more intense the second time and a little more the third time? Um, good, that was all fine. Let's talk about the, the sweep up to the B a little bit. So um, for anyone who has music in front of them for this, I always like to group. Uh, so we have, and then from there, I think I've, so triple it to the next group. So. So if we're always thinking to the first note of the next grouping, that helps give it a lot more direction. You've got good direction, but I think you can do even more with thinking of it in that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, again, it's one of these things that visually, kind of like we were just talking about with the Brahms with all those breaths in it. Visually, because of how the notes are lined up, we see three notes and then four notes and then six notes and then it, it's very up and down, very vertical. We want to get rid of that by always thinking over to the first note of the next group. Okay, so get away from thinking of three and four, but we think three uh, and a one and a two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five, six, one. Always thinking that way. Okay. Um, I think getting into 178, let's just look at that spot. So um, work on that ascending scale into 178, approaching the D. And, you know, this is kind of like what we were talking about um, or with, uh, again, a high D in uh, Lanor, right? Find the sound first that you want for that D. Again, this should be almost there, not their sound. It should be the most special uh, triple P D you've ever played in your life. Just play that D for me once. Try and find something really special that, where you want to end up on, on that D. You're finding it maybe a little more contained, a little more introverted. Yeah, that's more like it. I think you can go even softer than that, but that's, you're finding something there. And then practice approaching from the note before. And then two notes before. So that you really find the sound you want all the way through that scale up to the D. Because if we're just practicing always from the beginning of the scale, we may not find that sound that you want. I would practice backwards from the D. Find the sound you want there first, practice backwards. Okay. Um, and I think you can take more time in that ascending scale. Really prepare for the D. you need to make sure you're really in the spot you want to be for that and then once you get to that d you can take more time to crescendo cheyenne i was thinking of this for you too right because you're starting triple piano the crescendo doesn't actually even start marked until you're almost finished with that D, mm -hmm. right? And then you've got a long bar ahead of you before you get to the forte. So just don't, don't give too much too soon there. Okay. okay, beautiful, beautiful. One thing I noticed with both of you playing this excerpt was that you really are um, keeping with the, the basses, right? You always have to hear that repeated pattern going on in the basses and you have to stick with it. You can't take too much time. All the time needs to be within that framework. Okay, and there still is lots of room to take time and do beautiful things, but you just have to always stick with that. Okay, Mendelssohn. Um, I think, Avery, you should spend some time practicing this slurred because I don't think you're getting the sound that you want on this excerpt. And it's really hard to get a good sound with all that tonguing in the low register especially. But um, when I'm preparing this, I always, always practice it slurred. I make sure that I get a sound that is full enough, that's gonna project, sound that I'm happy with, and then I start practicing it tongued and trying to keep, keep what I've got, keep the sound that you've got. So almost equal practice, slurred and tongued. 
but yeah, that's, I think you want to get a, a more uh, full and clear sound for this. Um, and then the other thing is that I think your tonguing will even out a bit. If you have a little more support behind the sound, often when we have issues with tonguing that it sounds a little uneven or it's not quite working as clearly as we want it to, often if we think of the support behind it, it evens it out, just irons everything out. So I think perhaps think a little less about the taka taka ta and a little more about having a, a real column of air behind it that's just right like turning the hose on just <laughs> absolutely steady behind the tonguing that you're doing so that you it's a easier make sense yeah yep okay um good and then beethoven um Again, I think in that first bar, you can have more diminuendo. Okay, save some air and just, just move away from the fortissimo a little earlier. Um, and then one thing I thought was you could, uh, when you get into your triplets, make sure you're really hearing the violins because ba, 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 it just keeps going, right? When you're not playing the triplets, they are. And I think that will help it to be even more exact. It's very, very clean and very good. but just always have that soundtrack going in your head so that when you come in after a rest, you're just joining them, right? You're not coming in again on your own, but you're just joining what's already happening. Um, that same comment as uh, Cheyenne before, these things. Just clear the long note a little more before articulating the 16th. Okay, just a little daylight, let it in there. Uh, stylistically, that's, I think, the best. Um, and I know the grace notes, it's always, it always looks weird to do, fit so many notes in on the, on the beat. But I think you can take a little more time, be more lyrical with them. So they are sung notes. Right, ha da da dum is if you could sing a syllable on each of them. La dee dee dum. Okay. Good. And then lastly, for coffee, do you ever practice this with just the the tune, the hunter's tune? Yeah. Yeah. I think you can bring that out even more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I find that when you can really isolate that. It takes a bit of the scariness out of all of these groups of seven. And it often almost feels like you have more room for the big groups. If you can think of spreading out all those groups of seven a little more, I think it will help. Um, there's more time than you think. Are you thinking of an even seven? Or are you thinking three plus four or four plus three? I'm thinking of an even seven. It might help to think of three plus four okay. um, because then you get a little more chance to be lyrical at the beginning of it. And I think it may, it may help to even it out. It lets you spread out those first three notes a little more instead mm -hmm. of it sounding really frantic. Um, yeah. And if, if we just bring out the tune. So everything else just can lighten up and it's just filigree, it's just decoration, right? It's the bird, right? <laughs> it's the bird's tune of the, the hunters, flying around the hunters. So it's got extra little bits in there, but but really we just wanna, we wanna hear, hear the, the theme. Um, good, okay. Thank I you. Think I think we're at time, Jose. We are actually. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Joanna. It was a, a great, uh, a great masterclass. Uh, I really want to say thank you from the Orchestre Francophonie. Uh, I have accepted to participate and uh, um, bring something to our participants, especially I really like the uh, uh, sharing about your professional experience and refer referring to audition process was great. <laughs> appreciated. I'm glad that's helpful. <laughs> uh, well, well, our participant will let us know for sure. I, I'm, okay. I'm sure. 
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Great. My pleasure. And Take care, everyone. Great. And this is what ends uh, today's masterclass. Uh, thank you to all participants, members of the public, and to our guest, Joanna Gaufreur. And once again, thank you all to our sponsors. Merci, Joanna, d'avoir partagé vos connaissances avec nos participants et tout particulièrement euh, en regard avec le processus d'audition. Et c'est ce qui termine la classe de maître d'aujourd'hui. Merci de votre présence publique, participants et tout particulièrement à notre invité, Joanna Gaufreur. Encore une fois, des remerciements sincères à tous nos commanditaires. Bonne journée. <rires>